Good afternoon. My name is Chris Kimmel with Humanity in Deep Space, and I'd like to welcome you all to this third of our regular series of webinars uh, dealing with many of the really interesting and complex questions about humans transitioning into deep space. Uh, one of the motivations behind this initiative, Humanity in Deep Space, is really to dig below just questions of, of you know, propulsion systems, how we get to deep space, how we get back, uh, which are obviously very important. Some of the, the um, issues regarding you know, keeping us safe, radiation, et cetera, which are, again, are, are very important. But I think as we all recognize, uh, as we get closer and closer to actually moving into deep space, uh, there are a whole range of really complicated, hard problems that also need to be addressed and need to be uh, talked about in great detail if we're going to be successful in not only just surviving in deep space, but thriving in deep space. Questions regarding physiology, human psychology, uh, governance issues, uh, which are key, uh, food, you know, what are we going to eat? Questions of, of, of ethics, uh, space ethics uh, as well. Uh, educational uh, questions as well. So there's a there's a range of really interesting questions that again that they need to be addressed, which we try to do with humanity in deep space. And I would encourage all of you, if you've not been to the site, to go to the site at humanityindeepspace.com. Uh, we're building that site, but there's a lot of content that's developing on that, and it gives you an opportunity to also uh, also make contacts. So before we get going on today's webinar, I'd like to thank uh, our sponsors, which make uh, all of these uh, webinars possible. I want to thank all of those people again for the uh, for the, the not only just, just being a sponsor, but for the leadership and their commitment to innovation and commitment to big questions. Uh, I think that's that's important. None of these people sponsor just because it's it's an interesting thing to do. I think they do it because they believe uh, in what we're talking about. Uh, so having said that, let's uh, get into the topic today. It's a very interesting topic, which is question of, of you know, are we alone? Uh, and uh, it's something that we, as humans, have been interested in for uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Uh, and it becomes really a central, it is a central issue, I think, a central question of part of our, our quest to get off the planet. And that is, uh, there's a lot of things, reasons to get off, but one of them is to, uh, to perhaps, perhaps uh, try to find uh, issues of life in other places. Uh, before we start, let me introduce our two panelists. Let me start out with uh, Chelsea and have each of them uh, introduce themselves, please. Hey, um, thanks so much for inviting me to this panel, Chris. I'm Dr. Chelsea Haramia. I'm a philosophy professor at Spring Hill College in Mobile, Alabama. And I do a, a lot of work in, in my research in space exploration these days. And my background is pre predominantly in ethics. And so I think a lot about um, specifically astrobiology ethics. Astrobiologists are searching for life in the universe um, and thinking about questions surrounding that. And so I think about um, a lot of the ethical issues that that kind of practice raises. Great. And Dr. Chuck Coachello. Hi, thanks, Chris. <clears throat> I too want to thank you for inviting me and making this uh, webinar possible. I was trained and educated as a biologist. I had a doctorate in physiology, um, did some cancer research for a number of years, medical school teaching, helped establish a cancer research center in Louisville, your, your state there where you are now. Uh, and uh, during the last part of my full professional career was president of the University of North Dakota. Um, so in many ways, uh, a run-of-the-mill biologist published lots of articles, books on things like the special senses on cancer uh, and, and, a, and one on uh, the environment. Um, okay. I also have some space credentials, which I feel obligated to mention. We're tying me into the subject here today. Um, Back, I wouldn't even have been, had a doctorate if it were not for the Russians having launched Sputnik because they did, the, our government panicked, thought we were way behind. And so they made it possible for uh, guys like me and gals to get into uh, the sciences in greater numbers. Uh, my research was on blood coagulation and in hibernating animals which ties into the subject today because one of the rationale for doing this study was that the possibility of deep space travel by astronauts, who is according to many of the movies we've all seen, might be accomplished by putting astronauts to sleep for a long period of time. And the question is, how do you keep their blood from clotting when they're gonna be in bed for 
well, maybe years. So the blood coagulation question. <clears throat> and then um, during the early days of the space program, actually about the time that we put uh, people on the moon, so not so early, I guess, I was part of a biospace technology training program at Wallace Island in Virginia, where we were learning how to use telemetry to measure biological functions in space. And I was part of a team that maybe launched the very first check-in ever sent into suborbital space on a rocket. Uh, back this would have been like in 1969, 1970. And then finally, in, in semi-retirement, wrote a book on uh, it's uh, called The Tree Shack, which is a story about, about how life on Earth may have been brought here by an ancient, by a, a, an alien civilization, and then groomed eventually to produce the uh, humans as an intelligent, caring, uh, social species. So that was a little bit longer than Chelsea's, but then I'm about three times older than. All than, right. Than, yeah. well, that's, thanks, well, thanks, Chuck. Um, so let me let me do, let me first of all let's start off by I think framing the context uh, of uh, of this this question are we uh, uh, are we alone in the universe so I've got a, a couple of uh, poll questions I want to put up first for the audience um, and I ask each of them to to vote on the first one you can uh, and then we have another question to follow up and just also so you know. Uh, any of you, any of you watching and tuning in, uh, you can ask questions. Uh, uh, we'll get those questions and try to get to them uh, as the as the webinar goes on. Probably toward the end, we'll get to most of them. But please feel free to ask any kinds of questions as we go along. So the first question I'd like to ask uh, those of you watching the audience is: Do you believe the human species? Uh, do you believe human species are alone in the universe? And it's just a simple yes or no answer. Do you believe human species are alone or in the universe? So it looks like so far, uh, most of the audience says, uh, believes that, uh, no, we are not alone. Uh, that's interesting. So no, we are alone with about 86, 90 percent uh, uh, voting. So let me go back to a second question, a follow up to that. Uh, if we detected extraterrestrial intelligent life in the universe, uh, do you agree with the idea that we should attempt to send a message to them? or uh, perhaps, perhaps not. So those answers are yes, no, or it depends on the message. If we detect industrial intelligence, should we send a message? So right now that looks like uh, the answer, first of all, the second uh, looks like uh, is yes. Uh, right now, the second um, uh, first more popular is depends on the message. So having gone to that, let me ask, let me pose the first, uh, first question to people. Um, I think it's important to, to, to face on the context. When we talk about you know, life in the universe and finding that, um, I think some of us oftentimes we have a, a, a kind of a very local kind of neighborhood understanding of this and say, well, you know, we think of Earth and our own solar system. I mean, how big is, how big a, you know, what's the time and space issue that we're looking at? I mean, how big is it actually that, that when we talk about the universe and finding, uh, finding life? Chelsea, you want to? Okay, um, so I think that um, when we start thinking in these major universal terms, time and space, you know, um, kind of go hand in hand. And, you know, it's, you know, what, 14 billion years um, from the Big Bang um, or something like that. And, you know, um, the Hubble telescope has given us all this, uh, all these amazing images of just how many galaxies there are, um, just a plethora. And um, if we're thinking about how big is a universe, um, that's, a, that's a great question and, and an important scientific question. Um, we can also think of the question like how, uh, how nearby do we expect um, potential neighbors to be, right? Um, and so if we're thinking about uh, where is everybody, I think um, we're dealing with probabilities a lot when we're thinking about um, astrobiology and stuff like that. And so, um, most folks, I think, um, think that the highest probability is that um, they'll be in our galaxy, right, here in the Milky Way. Um, and that something like intergalactic um, kind of observations or communications um, are just not as likely given what we know about, about the laws of physics at this time. Okay. Jack, do you have any thoughts on 
Well, I do question. Uh, this is really the big thing that puts all of this in uh, perspective. So I happen to have a little visual aid here. This is a, a, a meter stick. Actually, it's a yardstick since we haven't adopted the metric system. But I added 3.3401 inches to the end of this yardstick. So it is now a meter long. And as you may know, um, uh, since we did study the metric system for a while in school, now, this would have 1,000 millimeters uh, in, in its uh, full length. And now, if this were the size of the Milky Way, which is very convenient because the Milky Way is 100,000 light years uh, in size, in diameter, um, every one of the millimeters on this, on this meter stick would be 100 light years. The thickness of a credit card would be 100, that's 100 light years. If you think about the a radio broadcast that was, uh, let's say, made in 1920, that would be 100 years ago, also a nice round number, very convenient, 100 years ago. How far has that radio signal reached as of today? And the answer would be about 100 light years. So in all that time, traveling at the speed of light, a radio signal left Earth and went the thickness of a credit card on this scale right here. The thickness of a credit card, one of the new thicker ones. Now that's too small to think about that way. Uh, the way to think about it in bigger scale is if our solar system, by the way, on this scale, it would be out to Neptune, uh, our solar system would be a fraction of the size of a virus, okay? We couldn't even see it on this scale. But if we made the solar system the size of a quarter, the Milky Way would be the size of the uh, continental United States, the full the length, yeah. 3,000 miles. And if um, the Milky Way were a, say a dinner plate, which is a good metaphor because it looks like one. Um, the rest of the observable universe and that observable universe would be the size of the state of Ohio. So scale, time and distance, it would take us 26,000 years to get from where we are on that dinner plate to the edge of it, 26,000 years. Uh, and yet the full observable universe is probably about a million times bigger than our okay. galaxy. Let me ask Dr. Harmia um, this question. Given that, how do we, I mean, even with this, even with the, the, the references that, that uh, uh, Chuck was giving, how do, we, how do we get our arms and our minds around how, how the, 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 the enormity of the universe and the enormity of this issue? Yeah, so I think we're actually really bad about thinking um, in the scales. Um, our minds aren't very good at grasping the the sort of um, kind of enormous scales of things like galactic or universal sorts of sizes. We're bad at like exponential reasoning, right? Um, and so I think things like Chuck's um, illustrations can be really, really helpful. But I think that's actually one of the areas where we're pretty we're pretty limited um, in our abilities to kind of wrap our minds around these concepts. Right. Yeah, I mean, if, as humans, if I could interject, when we yeah. uh, we we do all right up to maybe a million, <laughs> or uh, sometimes I think we can kind of get at a billion, but a trillion is beyond our ability to really grasp. I mean, if I told you that uh, a million seconds ago it was last early last Friday, Friday a week, two weeks ago. But a, a billion seconds ago was right during George Bush, the second one, his first year in office, so 32 years ago. But a trillion seconds ago, it was 30,000 BC. And when people hear that, they, they gasp. They say, well, wait a minute. To go from a, 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 a billion to a trillion, we actually go back 30,000 years. Yeah, well, 30 years times 1,000. <laughs> is 30,000 years. Right. So to point Chelsea's point, we don't quite have the ability as humans to really <laughs> get a hold of that. I mean, we can say it, we can right. hear it, we can even do the math using powers of 10 
but we don't quite grasp uh, very easily the numbers of that magnitude. Yeah, yeah, because I think as we as we've talked earlier, a lot of people have, have related to the the, the 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 size of the universe is such that it uh, you know may not be a surprise if there is life out there that we haven't haven't. Uh, Perhaps haven't contacted it yet. So let me let me let me let's. We've kind of established uh, very quickly uh, the spatial issues here and the time issues uh, in terms of what we're dealing with. But uh, let's get into some of the questions of of kind of perhaps why or why not we've we've actually been able to contact life. And, and first of all, I think there's two issues. Let me bring up. One is there is there intelligent life, and then the qu other question is just is there life. Uh, a lot of the work that we've been doing, NASA's been doing, and others with respect to life on Mars, doesn't is not necessarily dealing with intelligent life, but but any kind of life, whether it is exist or is it ex extinct, uh, and it's very you know very very small and microbial, and and uh, I'll, I'll get back to that. But uh, first of all, if there is intelligent life uh, in the universe, uh, how do we know? I mean, some people you know have questioned whether we would even recognize it. I mean, how would we actually recognize it? I mean, we as humans, uh, as we walk past an ant, pi ant pile, uh, we look at the ants and they're obviously uh, communicating with each other, but we can't communicate with them. So uh, what about that, that issue, uh, Chelsea? Um, so what are we looking for? How do we, how do we find it? Will we be able to recognize right. it? So there's, I think, I think Jill Tarter said at one point, we're looking for ourselves when talking about what astronomers and study practitioners are doing when searching for life and intelligent life. Um, not meaning that that's the only kind of life that could exist, I don't think, right? But meaning that that's what we have kind of the best shot of identifying. Right. Um, and so we look for what we have a good shot at identifying. And now there's the worry that that's the like, you know, drunk searching for, you know, her car keys under the, under the street light where, you know, if we're just looking where we can think we can see stuff, there's all this stuff out there beyond kind of um, the, the boundaries of the light where, um, you know, just, just much more probability that there's stuff. So we should, I think, of course, keep in mind, um, we have various limitations, not just conceptual limitations with our ability to wrap our minds around huge numbers um, and time scales but also um, sensory limitations, right? Um, there's stuff that we're not able to do sensorily. And we know this just even comparing our sensory capabilities to those of other species on earth, right? Um, uh, we're not very good at echolocation or something like that. Um, we're not very good at um, detecting things, um, just using our, what we're physically equipped with physiologically, um, infrared things or whatever yeah. like other yeah. animals are. So um, we, when we're looking, we're necessarily looking at kind of a, like a limited set of options. But I think what's important is that we're not all at the same time assuming that that's the only kind of kind of area where life could manifest um, in terms of, of our ability to identify it. Yeah. So, Jack, let me get following up on that. I mean, it, it's again, there may be life that we can't recognize, can't communicate with, uh, you know what? What? Uh, how? What? What are the implications of that? I mean, we. we I think we anthropomorphize, you know, uh, life as we think about it. You know, with extraterrestrial life being very somehow related to us as humans. Yeah. Well, of course, it, uh, we we could see we could speculate that there's some kind of a spectrum. Like I have trouble when I go to a foreign country and communicating right with people if I don't know the language there. I need an interpreter. But as far as the basic uh, idea, of what is life? I mean. It's, it's, a, it's a, a form of existence that actually is made up of material that's in the universe that repairs itself, that maintains itself, that reproduces, that moves either under its own power or is carried in some way to uh, around in other, other places. Uh, and it evolves, it evolves over time. That's the life we know. And of course, we've reached the point as a species now where we can actually manage our own evolution by doing genetic uh, engineering. And the prospect of that uh, looms very large. So it's hard to imagine other life forms that aren't carbon-based like the one we know of here. So it, to Chelsea's point, in the beginning, that's what we'll be looking for. And I think it, even, even more primitively than that, we'll be looking for evidence Mm -hmm. not, not exactly proof because of these distances involved. 
we'll just be searching for evidence like a signal mm -hmm. that's traveled through yeah. some undetermined stretch of space and got here somehow. Now, Ari Loeb, Ari Loeb at Harvard had a book came out a couple of months ago called Extraterrestrial, uh, which was kind of interesting. I encourage people to read it. But one of the things that he he talks about in that book is that we may be looking at the wrong things because his book deals with the possibility of uh, technological remnants of advanced civilizations uh, uh, being out there and that maybe the, farm, the, the, the primary means that what we're looking for life uh, perhaps is not the is not the best way to do it. Uh, Chelsea, you have what's any thoughts primary, on that? What do you mean by primary means? Well, through, through you know, ra radio waves, other oh, kinds yeah. of, of lasers. Because yeah. Yeah, his book deals with the possibility that we've, we've had uh, remnants of, of technology that might have right. entered our solar system. We don't, and I think, know. yeah, because we, we brought in the Drake equation, right, right, when we were talking about setting up this webinar. And there's, I think it's L in the Drake equation, which is like the length of time that a civilization is, is transmitting. Um, technological capabilities. And so um, it sounds like what you're asking is what if like there, there is some sort of techno signature, whether it's intentional or not, it's been transmitted, but at this point um, it's evidence, uh, it's a relic, right? Um, it's evidence of a, of a no longer around civilization, however time works um, in these senses. And so, so getting a better sense of how, what, what kind of kind of conditions make it the case that advanced civilizations aren't able to um, transmit signals anymore or able to, um, to leak <laughs> radio, you know, things like that. Right. Um, so, so I think we should be thinking, I mean, that's, and that's just a tough one. And that's something that scientists can look into. You mentioned like, oh, maybe we're looking at the wrong things. Um, why can't, why can't it be all the things, right? Um, why can't we have, you know, astronomers, astrophysicists, astrobiologists, you know, looking out for techno signatures, um, bio signatures, whether they're remnants or whether they, um, you know, are potentially active, um, as well as um, looking at scientific evidence um, in other kind of places potentially, you know, here on earth. Um, and all of this kind of, all of these um, options, they can be studied scientifically. Um, and I think of course, what we want is for them to be studied, you know, kind of openly and intersubjectively among among experts um, to find out what we have the best reason to believe given the physical evidence that we have. Okay. You know, if I could add something here, I, one of the other G whiz things about distances and the, the, the well, the, the the difficulty of trying to grasp the, the scope of what we'd be trying to do here. Uh, Carl Sagan, back when he was uh, alive, said famously that there were more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on all the beaches of the world. And I've seen estimates since then that actually up that by a factor of uh, two, five orders of magnitude, like 10,000 stars for every grain of sand. Consider the, the, the impossibility of examining <laughs> any fraction of every grain of the sand on, in this world. When like even Australia by itself has 47,000 miles of beaches. Okay, we, no, the numbers get up into the 10 to the 20th, 10 to the 25th, beyond that uh, possible numbers of stars. And of course we know we can never even experience or see uh, parts of the universe because they're beyond our uh, uh, beyond our reach. So the it, it given all that, that one big thing when Frank Drake and that group back in the 50s did the equation late 50s, early 60s, um, that thing about how long does a civilization last at Chelsea's point was the one that got them hung up the most, I think. And I think an element that they didn't even really spend much time on back then, but if you think about it more now, is the difficult or the, the challenge of overlap. That whatever you think that number is of how long a civilization might last, the, odd, the universe has been able to make Earth-like planets for about half of its existence, which would be almost 7 billion years. The Earth's been around for only about, um, four, a little less. Um, if you do some of the math, you find that there's only about a one in four million chance that two civil any two civilizations have overlapped at all. 
even for a minute because of that great stretch of time where we could exist. Now the big unknown, how long does a civilization last? Right. Well, and even the question I think is a little bit more specific because we can imagine a civilization like ours lasting beyond, but, but our technological capability is coming to an end for some maybe catastrophic reason, right? And so it's, I mean, there are just kind of two distinct questions there. How long does civilization last? And then how long does like transmission um, last, right, of a civilization. And so we could have some, you know, like a super volcano or, uh, I mean, that could be humanity ending, right. but you know, something that, that's very catastrophic, but doesn't end humanity. It just kind of brings us back to like very primitive capabilities, um, uh, massive solar storms or something just knocking out everything. And we have to start from something not unlike scratch. Um, and so thinking about those possibilities, is that happening out? Um, are there places where, you know, just, just considering like, if, if we're looking at what that that kind of factor is is asking, um, there are kind of speculations, right? Um, is is the ending of a transmission, does that mean the civilization ended or does that mean technology ended but the civilization continued? Um, or does that mean technology took a different form that, you know, as Chris mentioned earlier, maybe we're not capable of recognizing. So it looks to us like it ended, but in fact it shifted or something like that. Yeah, one, yeah. Of, the, one of the, let me let me just add here, one of the, get, get us, one of the interesting points I think some of you probably is this this concept of uh, um, uh, that a number of people have have put forth that um, uh, the great filter uh, that perhaps uh, one of the reasons and it's interesting because they they also I've heard it also postulate that uh, because of this concept which I'll get to in a second uh, if we find evidence of life on Mars, however primitive, it's not necessarily a good thing for us as humans on the planet Earth. And the reason being is this concept of the big filter. Uh, if we find life on Mars, that certainly changes the equation quite a bit uh, in terms of the probability of advanced life being in the universe. Um, and the possibility that one reason why we have not encountered uh, intelligent life other places is that uh, technology, back to your point, Chuck, just uh, in terms of time frames, that uh, it, civilizations, once they reach a certain level of technological uh, 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 innovation and uh, et, et cetera, uh, they destroy themselves, uh, either through war or climate change or whatever it might be. And the reason that we haven't uh, uh, contacted any or encountered any extraterrestrial civilizations right so far with life is that they, uh, they, they reach this point of the filter where they actually destroy themselves and don't reach, uh, uh, don't, don't continue to evolve. Any thoughts there? Well, I have one that I wanted to interject before you made that point, uh, Chris, and that is there's a, there's a part of that Drake equation uh, he had seven elements, but there's an eighth one. <laughs> uh, and that is, what if they they don't want to be found? Right. Right? So they're, uh, they've are they grown up and decided, you know what, we better shut up. I mean, maybe they, uh, they heard about uh, the equivalent of what happened to the Incas when the Spaniards came to Central and South America. They, we don't want to be discovered uh, or, or connected with um, some... Uh, civilization far away, they might bring us disease. They might uh, come and uh, kill us and take what we have. Uh, so we're just going to be quiet. In fact, we're going to set up some barriers to being discovered because we don't want to be found. Mm -hmm. So just another one of the el another elements of that uh, that equation, and I think it's a distinct possibility. And yeah. There's so much fun speculation that you can like build around that, right? Because another candidate answer that some folks have talked about in some of the literature is, you know, what if there's actually a whole galactic community out there um, and they are kind of selective about whom they allow into the community and um, there are criteria that need to be met and they know how to remain kind of like um, non-observable to to anyone they don't want to include in the galactic community until they, you know, some people say, what if we need to show that we are capable of being like good members of the galactic community? And that, like, that's a criterion. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a potential ex right, explanation for, for the silence. And so yeah. there's just so much interesting ex speculation that can be yeah. done about like, why, why so much silence? 
<laughs> well, and I think I think both of what you're talking about is interesting because I think we tend to approach as humans approach a lot of problems this way, big hard problems, and that is we approach them we approach them from our perspective as if the rest of the world or the universe um, uh, behaves like us, thinks like us, looks like us, and and there's reason no you know obviously um, no no evidential reason is necessarily necessary to to believe that of course. Uh, Chuck referred earlier to Carl Sagan, and I think he was the one that, you know, that talked about, you know, the, the humans are simply an example of the universe becoming self-aware. Uh, and so we're not distinct from the universe. We are the universe. We are an example of the universe becoming self-aware. And I think, um, I think looking at these various um, uh, possibilities uh, is, is, is important because I think we, we maybe assume that if there is life, we would find it. They may want to be found. They may not want to be found, et cetera. Um, but what is, let me, let me get a little bit more perhaps philosophical about this. So um, what is the, what are the, some of the deep philosophical maybe questions or issues uh, that uh, make us as humans so interested, obviously then other than just the obvious things, and, and finding out whether there's, there's a, a life out there and, and what, what happens if, you know, what happens if we discover it in an evidential way or what happens if we don't? Well, if we're thinking about what makes us so interested in this question, I think, you know, that may be just more of a psychological question um, and probably lots of good um, research can be done on that. But if we're thinking about kind of some of the deep philosophical questions related to search for life and intelligent life. Um, I think we immediately need to start doing some conceptual analysis. I know some folks have mentioned this in the chat, like um, what, what do we mean by intelligence, um, right? We don't actually have kind of neat and tidy boundaries around that concept. Um, seems like we might have some neat and tidy boundaries for life. Chuck mentioned, right, um, this list of, here's how something qualifies as life. And then he was careful to say, like, as far as we know, right? right. Um, and so there are even here on earth, you know, kind of borderline cases, um, our virus is alive. Um, they meet some of the criteria, but not all, but there's, um, maybe there's a gradation, right? Um, some folks say that. And so like, something like life, which seems very straightforward, something that can be, you know, tossed under a microscope, um, even that we need philosophy to kind of help us do this conceptual analysis to really think, okay, well, like, where might the boundaries be? Um, and of course, we can recognize that we might not get like certainty at this point, at this stage in the in the in humans kind of um, exploration, but to to acknowledge that this is still kind of an open question, open question, what is life? What is intelligence? And what do we need um, to, um, to kind of like create boundaries around these concepts. But then of course, I think as Chuck mentioned as well, um, we also know when there are clear cut cases, right? If we find something that is, uh, you know, reproduces and it repairs and it, um, all these things, um, we, we might, we make, well, that's definitely life, right? Um, but it also, there may be things that don't qualify, right? And so those are some like, just kind of conceptual analysis, philosophical questions, and then there's a bunch of ethical questions, right? Um, and that's in the realm of philosophy too. What do we owe to like, what are our obligations or our duties right. to, um, to life? What is truly valuable in and of itself? Um, and a lot of folks think that, you know, there's something about um, being alive that at least should be factored into our moral deliberations. Um, it's, there may be something morally different from a hunk of rock. Um, some people think that hunks of rocks may have um, some, some value in and of themselves um, or as part of a, an increasingly complex universe. There's lots of really interesting kind of um, arguments and ideas about what we owe stuff um, mm -hmm. out there in the galaxy, in the universe, in our solar system, even um, beyond what we sort of agree on in terms of what we have duties to here on right. Earth. Chuck, do you have anything to add there? Well, the <clears throat> the arguments from looking, I mean, or uh, why are we? Why are we? It's one of the manifestations of life as well. Again. Right. It, it's always looking for another opportunity. Always exploits. I mean, we're struggling here as a planet now to confront this you know, global warming crisis. So half of us apparently don't even believe it's a problem. And yet we've had others who pointed out that it definitely is. Carl Sagan actually became famous at first because of his uh, conclusion that Venus was inhospitable because of the greenhouse kind of an effect there on that planet. Uh, so it's not a new problem, and yet we struggle with it. And it raises the question, go back to that question about how long will civilizations 
survive. And the characteristic of life that has it maybe only now that we are intelligent with quotation marks around intelligent, we'll learn not to foul our own nest to the point where we can't live here anymore, which is mm -hmm. a, an existential threat, obviously, today as we, as we speak. So uh, it's one of those filters, Chris, that you talked about that keeps the civilization truncated at one end. You know, it's only going to be around a while because life moves, but it also exploits. And so I would expect that regardless of whatever decision we might make, let's say in the United Nations about should we, should we explore space, we're going to do it. Right. We're going to go out there and we're going to see what's out there. We're going to find it if it's there, uh, because that's what we do. We, we, as humans, it's part of our uh, biological heritage. Yeah, we're going to I'm not going to get into that too much. We have actually a future webinar that's going to talk with that about that issue specifically. But um, just to quickly raise the point that that's that's right. Um, and um, many of our experiences, our exploration, uh, you know, haven't been uh, particularly pretty. Uh, and so that's another question I think a lot of people are, are, are raising and just in terms of how are we going to do this uh, this time as opposed to in the past. Uh, I want to I bring up jump in, oh, um, sure. really quickly, um, something that some folks have talked about when thinking about the ethical values or morality of extraterrestrial intelligence, um, there's a suggestion or speculation that, well, maybe it's possible that if a civilization is going to survive long enough to be transmitting long enough to be detected by us, um, that means that they've overcome a lot of the ethical challenges that we find ourselves facing here with things like global warming and whatnot. Um, and so maybe that's some reason to think that uh, an alien civilization that we're in a position to detect and even contact is going to be morally advanced, right? Um, mm. And so it's just a thing to think about. But then other folks come in on the other side and say um, that kind of presumes a social structure uh, that resembles human social structure. And we don't right. have good reason to, to conclude, at least. We can speculate, but not conclude with any, any real certainty um, that that's the kind of social structure an extraterrestrial intelligence would have. Um, and so just, just, just some interesting thoughts yeah. about our, um, what causes us to destroy ourselves, right? Um, it's, it's, you know, maybe these drives, but also sort of maybe it's um, some of these ethical uh, values that we hold or, or, or fail to hold. One of the interesting, I want to throw out something by... Um... Uh, a, a colleague of, uh, of mine who's also involved in um, uh, humanity and deep space on some issue, on a number of issues is Joel Sursel. Joel Sursel, who's the CEO and uh, president of Trans Astronautic Corporation. Uh, in conversations I've had with him, he's, he's raised an interesting issue about what he calls the, the tripwire. Uh, and that perhaps one reason uh, why we haven't, in, if there is intelligent life, they haven't necessarily made contact with us or in some way or the other is that we haven't yet uh, pushed that tripwire. Uh, and the tripwire perhaps being that, um, you know, once we get moving, as we, once we transition into deep space uh, and uh, begin uh, perhaps um, uh, facing the possibility of in some way uh, disturbing, interrupting uh, other forms of life in deep space, or the, the, the I guess the uh, symmetry of deep space, that that may be the tripwire. And if they're out there, uh, perhaps that's what encourages them uh, to contact, you know, to basically to make contact with us. That up to this point, it's like, yeah, you're pretty insignificant. We're not concerned about it. On the other hand, uh, once you reach a certain point uh, that it perhaps threatens uh, uh, other parts of the universe or our solar system. Any, any, uh, which I thought was kind of, if nothing else, a pretty interesting uh, uh, question. Yeah, that is really interesting. Um, just as a, you know, as a potential explanation, or like, you know, this, this uh, raises this question of, you know, what could we be doing now that could increase the chances? Um, and you know, some people think, well, we should be, you know, trying to kind of be like, hey, here we are, send out beacons. Because right. maybe people are waiting for evidence. This is like the zoo hypothesis, maybe, or one version of it. Maybe folks are waiting for evidence that we are interested in communicating and they're just not able to kind of identify that desire in us. 
um, given what we're doing here on the ground. And so that's just another, another way of kind of saying like, you know, they know we're here, but we're not significant enough until we yeah. show a sign, you know, but that's a different, cause some, the folks who want to say, let's, Let's message, let's signal, let's send out beacons, because that could be the thing that jumpstarts communication. Um, like, are thinking we want to get interaction. We want to, we want to really kind of maximize the chances of that. And it sounds like this. What you're talking about is a scenario where what we do is kind of get the wrong kind of attention, right? And yeah. um, we get attention for being dangerous. And you know, you maybe don't want to be viewed as dangerous, or you want to be extra careful. Um, and so. I, I actually think um, there's probably, a, if you sat down and thought about it a lot, there's probably a bunch of other tripwires we could come up right. with, like potential right. potential things like, that could trigger. Yeah. I'd like to wave back in with my meter okay. stick. <laughs> Just for a second here. The, the, you really the, like that stick, don't you, Chuck? Yeah, I do. I get it. Okay. It's an extra uh, <laughs> uh, stick, but it serves the purpose. The, you know, we've been sending out a signal since 1920 radio signal that's one millimeter thick into the galaxy that's big, right? That's just this galaxy. So unless we come up with a means of sending signals faster than the speed of light, which I'm told is not possible, at least nobody's come up with anything that sounds uh, real along those lines. Uh, how do they how do they detect us? Do you, do you presuppose some means they have of watching over us? Like they right. come right here through some means way faster than the speed of light and spy on us and they're monitoring us, maybe. That's what I have in my book, by the way, is a story about how they how they actually groomed us as a species. We're kind of a zoo in my book, the earth is. Uh, and they're watching to see whether they can develop a species that will avoid the mistakes they made in their own civilization. But to the point, to your point about tripwires, uh, what forms did they take which somebody would actually see? Yeah. How would they see it? Yeah, well, that brings it. Let's pick up the, uh, uh, the third uh, question, um, which I think is, is mm -hmm. kind of helps put this in context uh, about that gets to the issue of uh, uh, light years and deep space and how long it, how long it takes. So here's the question for uh, those watching. Launched almost 50 years ago, if Voyager 1 left the solar system a few years ago, and as of Memorial Day was 14.1 billion miles from Earth. So the question is, how long will, how, how long will, will before Voyager who have traveled one light year? So if you look at that question, this will give us a context. So is it, do you believe it's five years? Uh, 10 years, 5,000 years, or 17,000 years? How long before Voyager will have traveled one light year? So looks like uh, most of the people so far say 17,000 years. So are they close, Chuck? They're close, yeah. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of 20,000 20, years Per, to reach a one light year traveling at Voyager speeds, which is about, Voyager 1 traveled, I think, 35,000 miles per hour. Voyager 2 was a little faster, but yeah, it takes uh, almost 20,000 years to get one light year away. So it means things like the nearest star to our sun is uh, about, um, 40, about 80,000 light, 80,000 years away traveling at Voyager speed. To get to um, the nearest planet that we know for sure orbits a star somewhere, that would be Gliese probably. That's uh, 400,000 years to get there at Voyager speed. So it puts this again in, yeah. in perspective. On my yardstick, by the way, the distance between Earth and uh, Proxima Centauri, the closest star to our sun, would be thinner than a human hair. Okay. Yeah. One of the questions yeah, that came in, well, I'm assuming one of the questions that came in earlier, just want to get this, talks about because of these vast differences, uh, of course, we've theoretically, we've talked about this, that what, what role might time dilation uh, uh, in terms of space travel actually, actually play in this? Because again, as we've been talking about the, 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 um, uh, the distances are, are, are enormous, and we all, all know that um, 
you know, if we were to, if humans were to leave and travel to some of these distant stars, um, you know, it would be, uh, would what would role would time dilation have to maybe play in this? Chelsea, you have anything to think about that? Somewhat related. Um, I just, I think that Chuck raises a good point when pointing out, like, given what we know about physics and science, um, this is just very extremely unlikely that we're being observed, right? right. Um, and so if we're doing, if we're doing kind of scientific um, searches into the solar system, galaxy, universe, et cetera, um, we have to we have to have some assumptions we're working under, right? Um, or if we're thinking about the search for life, um, we have to like kind of pick some assumptions that we're working under. And if we're actually doing the science, right, we should pick what um, we have the best scientific or physical reason to believe, right? And so like it's kind of, it's out there as a candidate, maybe we're being observed, but maybe there's not right. a lot, maybe our best evidence suggests that we should operate under the assumption that we're not because of these vast distances or something like that. Um, and now I'm not too sure about time dilation. You might want to talk to some you know, physicists about that, but um, if we're thinking about how long we may have been detectable um, to another civilization, if we're thinking about techno signatures, our own techno signatures, um, right? Radio broadcasts are some of the first times that um, we started leaking out stuff into, um, you know, beyond the bounds of earth that might be detected. But there are some who have argued that we've been, you know, emitting, earth has been emitting biosignatures for billions of years, right? right. And so we know that astrobiologists, they're not just looking for, um, you know, laser beams, they're looking for um, signs of life and all these kind of cool, interesting ways they kind of try to indirectly observe that. And so maybe we're more observable than we think if we kind of expand um, what we've been emitting to, to include our own biosignatures as a planet, in addition to our own techno signatures as a species. And maybe it's like this kind of continuum of, of our kind of signaling, signaling our existence. Um, but again, that just, that just brings in to the fold this idea that like, well, if we're thinking philosophically about this, we should be speculating, including all these possibilities, being kind of very open about um, what what has the potential for justification. Um, but if we're kind of pursuing a scientific project, we may go think we should really prioritize what we know at least about the laws of physics um, and the distances and what we have the best reason to assume. Well, we may still remain open-minded about our assumptions, um, recognize that, that those are the most justified for the time being at least. I have a thought here just to interject that it's uh, rather than uh, go looking for intelligent life or even, uh, well, let's say intelligent life, just for the sake of uh, discussion, we, we would have no idea where to start looking. Okay, well, obviously we'll look where the closest, the closest places first. And maybe, and this is a little silly, but better to wait to bump into them. After all, we're moving around our galaxy at a speed of 500,000 miles per hour with our whole solar system. So we're going around the complete circuit Every 230 million years, we make a complete circuit. Uh, we could wait till Andromeda galaxy comes here. It's moving toward us at, at the rate of about 70 miles a second, even though space is expanding. It's coming at us and closing in at 6 million miles a day, closer to us every day. So rather than spend a lot of energy, because it's very expensive, uh, who knows what cost in human lives if we were to get out there to go looking. Why not just wait till we bump into them since we're traveling and moving already around the universe and they're moving toward us. Just yeah. wait till we bump. Well, one of the interesting, uh, interesting you brought that up, one of the interesting points that Abby Loeb brings up in his book, uh, the, tr extra, uh, the Trest Extraterrestrial, which I also thought was interesting. He kind of alludes to that. Uh, he's an astrophysicist fellow at Harvard, uh, is that more than likely, uh, if we do encounter uh, intelligent life somewhere, it's going to take a very, very, very long time just because of the expanse, what we're talking about. Uh, and uh, a, a lot of people, uh, I think this brings it back to maybe why we should take care of ourselves as well. It's not an either or proposition. And he said, because of that, uh, the first thing we have to do is we have to make sure that we as earthlings are survive long enough uh, to be able to encounter that which suggests uh, taking care of the earth. You know, a lot of people see this as a, a kind of a bifurcation, you know, why we go looking at space if we 
don't take care of our place for some of the questions that have come in have, have dealt with this question. You know, why are we spending money on this when there are so many problems on Earth? Uh, and, and certainly there are. But it's an interesting point uh, that he made that that may be one of the actually one of the driving uh, driving issues is that if we really are serious as, as a species of perhaps encountering, whether we bump into them or we find them or whatever, is that we're going to have to survive a long time, uh, more than likely to do that. And if we don't take care of ourselves, we don't take care of the earth, um, we're going to eliminate that, that possibility, which I thought was an interesting, interesting point. Yeah, it's good to keep in mind just how intergenerational this sort of project of searching um, for whatever in the universe, just how intergenerational that has to be. Um, I think Chuck mentioned we don't know where to start looking. I would push back on that a little bit because, right, we we can start looking at like habitable exoplanets, right? Because um, astrobiologists have made some headway in this area and figured out where um, there's kind of you know increased likelihood um, for there to be life, potentially intelligent life. So, um, but ideally, you know, you'd want to look pretty broadly, um, and that is a lot of um, a lot of work. Um, but when we think about what we do and why, right? Science is a value laden project, right? Um, what we pursue scientifically, we pursue um, because of what we value. <laughs> um, and it's potentially very valuable for us to make, a, make scientific discoveries in space. Um, all sorts of scientific discoveries, including discovery of life in our solar system or elsewhere, and of course, of intelligent life. Um, now people like to talk about the risks um, because you know we, we stand to, to, to enormously benefit um, or, right. or even just to like gain more knowledge, which was itself potentially valuable all by itself. Um, but there's also, you know, we stand to potentially um, risk very important things like our species or our planet. Um, and so I think all of that comes into play when we think of uh, what are the effects, what are the risks and rewards of, of looking and of spending resources on this. Um, but I do notice that people often kind of point out, look, there's so many problems on earth. Why do we spend resources going into space? And um, I think we can take very seriously the sentiment behind that question. There's a lot of important work to be here, to be done here on earth to kind of like fight um, serious problems um, and oppressions and issues. And at the same time, it's quite possible that scientific space exploration um, could, could benefit us in some of these projects. Um, and if we are kind of thinking about, oh, where do we spend and divvy up and distribute our resources? Um, right. There's resources being used everywhere, right? Um, why aren't we looking at um, all sorts of other places where people are um, using or accumulating a bunch of resources and say, why aren't you helping more you know, on earth? Um, yeah, I scientific th endeavors really, right, no. um, are open-ended enough that there's there's potential for great value. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it isn't a it's not a uh, you know a zero sum game. I, I right. think we've already discovered that through space. You know, the difficulties of space exploration uh, basically make us deal with very hard problems. Uh, that I agree that may open up doors for Earth life on Earth today, as we have already seen. We've had examples of that of technologies and other things that already benefit uh, benefit humans. Um, just real, real quick, as we we're getting a little bit near the end um, of our conversation, uh, which I thought was interesting. Recently, of course, there's been a lot of talk uh, of the release of the government's UFO uh, information, which uh, is 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 kind of interesting. And I I um, uh, one of the things uh, that I read was, which I I'd again a point that I came across the other day is that well, you know. With if these sightings, you know, about these sightings, why, if they're so sophisticated, uh, why would they quote, why would it be, is, is this life, this uh, extraterrestrial intelligent life form, let us see them, uh, which is kind of an interesting question. And I read just the other day in an article about this, uh, which I thought was a, an interesting retort to that. It said, you know, uh, if we have, if we have uh, a drones uh, and we go over uh, uh, uh uh, you know, uh, use the drones to go over a herd of cattle in some place. Uh, we're not particularly concerned that they're going to see the drones. Uh, and, uh, you know, another reason that perhaps, you know, they're not, they're sophisticated enough where, again, we use our human perceptions to say, well, why would they want to be seen? Maybe they don't, you know, maybe they don't care. Uh, maybe they so are so far advanced 
uh, that that's not a big, you know, a big issue with them with, again, I thought was, was, was kind of interesting. And of course there may not be any they there. I mean, right. That's always a possibility. So we don't know what it is. Right. <clears throat> yeah. But I, I think, but what, let me, in, in just to, to, to wrap up here in a second, um, Forget. Let's forget for a second. Estes for us to be an intelligent life. What about what about if we just find if we go to Mars or we go to uh, uh, another planet on our system or our solar system or a moon? Um, what about if we find evidence of uh, uh, either extinct or current, uh, uh, very primitive by our standards, very primitive life? What are the implications of that? I mean Chuck is, I think, in a position to talk about this, right? But that's going to help potentially answer some fundamental questions about the right. origin of life, right? Sure. And it's so actually, that would be great. I, mean, I feel about it as a biologist. It just is likely, if not more likely, that the life actually came here from someplace else to begin with. Uh, so it, it's, uh, it's every bit as likely statistically, as far as I know, given the factors I know about, that that's how it got here, but the, as opposed to the odds of it arising spontaneously here and there. Right. They come from somewhere else to both places. And maybe you came there first and rose all the way to a, some form of civilization yeah. before, way before it did here. There was an article recently uh, talking for by a, uh, uh, an astrophysicist who was making the comment that in his view, it's likely, it's possible, very possible, or if possible at least, that we may have already exported life to Mars uh, through our missions so far, through our robotic missions, that despite our best interest at in decontaminating uh, uh, the equipment, we know, for, we know how uh, through things like extremophiles and other things, how hardy bacteria and viruses can be, that it's not, uh, it may be that we already uh, if we actually find primitive life, it, uh, you know, it may be us. Yeah. yeah. Planetary contamination a, is a big issue. Yeah. Um, especially with those Mars explorations. Right. Yeah. There's an article in this month, uh, maybe last one, Scientific American, about finding bacteria in deep ocean sediments way down below where there's any life um, that they were able to revive after the sediment uh, had been there for 100 million years. Now, for life to get here from somewhere else, all we would have to have done is ride here in some way that was some, some way shielded from uh, the obvious danger of radiation in deep space. But, you know, there are things flying apart and, you know, there go pieces go by here every day and some of them actually hit <laughs> even today. We look at planets that aren't protected by, I mean, bodies that aren't protected by an atmosphere like the moon and Mars itself that show that impacts are almost a daily occurrence, debris coming from other places. So it's entirely plausible, as, as I see it, that life gets scattered around just like seeds in the wind uh, down here on Earth. Uh, a similar kind of model. Only right. start who knows when. <clears throat> Dr. Harmia, you were going to say something? Hey, it is. We're almost out of time and it's a bit, a bit tangential. Right. Um, That's okay. So we're just thinking of like, where, where do we start looking? And one of the answers is, well, looking at habitable exoplanets. And one of the things that makes them habitable is having the potential for um, an atmosphere or a significant right. atmosphere. Um, but I think what Chuck just said reminded me of something I, I heard recently, which is that, um, you know, knowing what we might, you know, if we go to Mars, we're we're not gonna spend time on the surface, certainly not exposed. And in fact, it might involve like digging deep and being underground um, and kind of moving our technology to um, a planet without an atmosphere, without much atmosphere. And um, that's that's the kind of thing that once we realize it's a possibility that can be factored into the search elsewhere, right? Um, right. Looking at planets with atmospheres, but also if we're looking for technology, maybe they've exported technology to, to planets without atmospheres. Um, because you know um, that stuff doesn't need doesn't need the atmosphere the way um, yeah. like a biological uh, organism would, um, and so that that just again broadens that scope of, of no, where to look. I agree. <laughs> well, we, it just would check that we already know that there are uh, bacteria, viruses, whatever organisms 
uh, that have survived in space. Uh, yeah, they found files, this on yeah. space station uh, that have been able to survive in the harsh, harsh environment of space, which I'm sure uh, uh, 50 years ago we wouldn't have thought is is possible. Uh, and so to to uh, to kind of finish up, I think that's maybe one of the big big questions. If we whether we you know when we if we find life or we don't find life, both of those have huge consequences uh, for us as humans and for us uh, on the planet Earth and for the planet Earth itself. Um, let me, um, first of all, thank um, the two of you for um, your great commentary and joining us today. Uh, it's been great. It's been a lot of interesting. Uh, both of these people obviously publish. Uh, you can follow them, I'm sure, on some of the social media pages, and I, I would encourage you to do that. Um, let me also, again, thank uh, our sponsors uh, who make this possible, Space Tango, uh, who is our, our, our lead sponsor, Kentucky Science Technology Corporation, the National Stem Cell Foundation, uh, which actually is doing some very interesting work uh, in zero gravity, looking at uh, uh, things with Parkinson's disease and others and stem cells, uh, the Baird uh, Wealth Management Group, the Shelgren Center at the University of Kentucky, uh, 22 Solutions, uh, a very uh, uh, production team that's doing some really interesting work in, in very innovative production technologies today. Uh, the START program, uh, PDA lighting and sound, uh, the higher orbits uh, led by uh, um, Michelle Lucas uh, and Media Collaboratory. Uh, and thank all of them for making this possible as well as humanity and deep space possible. Uh, if you, we're going to be developing um, a newsletter soon, so you should be, all of you who signed up for these various webinars will be on our mailing list for the newsletter. Uh, we'll also be rolling out some uh, additional uh, ideas uh, and questions for people uh, to talk about. So we look, ask you to look forward to that. And please, if you have any comments, uh, if you have any uh, suggestions of other things we might do with uh, humanity in deep space, please, please uh, send those to us. You can go again, go on our uh, website at humanityindeepspace.com and make a comment and let us know. So uh, again, thank everyone for joining us and we look forward to talking with you uh, at our next webinar. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, thank Chris. you.